Exodus 33, uh, as you remember when we left off, Exodus 32 was one of the low points for the Israelites. While Moses was finishing up his 40 days and 40 nights on Mount Sinai, getting all the instructions from the Lord, bringing down the Ten Commandments on the two tablets, uh, the people down below had uh, talked Aaron into uh, making this gold calf. And they're worshiping and committing idolatry and sexual immorality. And it's just a horrible situation. And that when Moses sees this, he breaks the two tablets of stone that contain the Ten Commandments. And he calls out, who is on the Lord's side? Only the tribe of Levi steps forward. But as a result of their sin, their wickedness and rebellion, 3,000 Israelites are put to death. I made that contrast last time that when the law came down the mountain, 3,000 died. When the Holy Spirit came down on the day of Pentecost, 3,000 people got saved. So there's a good contrast between what the law does and what the Holy Spirit can do. Uh, the really sad and shocking part to all this was how many times God had revealed himself to the Israelites over the last year. It's been a little over a year since they left Egypt, but the 10 plagues that God brought upon the Egyptians, the parting of the Red Sea, and they all walk on dry land, Manna from heaven, water from the rock. I mean, God provided so much for them. The cloud by day, the pillar of fire by night. They all witnessed these things. They all experienced these things. And yet, they still rebelled against the Lord. And at this point, Moses and all the Israelites are probably wondering, what is God going to do now? Are we going to go to the promised land, or is he finished with us? Is he going to abandon us out here in the wilderness is he going to destroy us as we deserve, or is he still going to be with us? And so after their rebellion, they're now living in fear and shame and are probably wondering what further consequences uh, there might be. Some people look at Exodus 33 as Israel being the prodigal nation, much like the prodigal son in Luke 15, where the son wasted all of his father's inheritance, um, even though God was so, the father was so good to him. He blew it, but he blew it big time, but he humbled himself. He came back and his father received him. And we see similar things take place here with the Israelites. They've messed up big time. They took advantage of God's relationship um, that he had with them. So I'm sure two questions that often come to mind when we blow it, when we mess up is, am I forgiven? And is there a future for me? First of all, are we really forgiven when we mess up? Absolutely. If you confess your sin, repent, there is forgiveness. There's cleansing. There is restoration from the Lord. Uh, there might be some heavy-duty consequences when you sin, but God's word is clear from 1 John 1, uh, 2, verses 1 and 2. It says, My little children, these things I write to you so that you may not sin. Well, that's the ideal situation. You know, he doesn't want us to. And if anyone sins, and fortunately that includes all of us, since none of us are perfect, we still stumble and fall. But when we do, we have an advocate with the Father, Jesus Christ the righteous. And he himself is a propitiation for our sins, and not for ours only, but also for the whole world. So there is forgiveness in the Lord. The second question is, can God still use me? Uh, yes, he can. Maybe not to the same capacity as he once did. I mean, I've been a pastor here, what, 35 years this year. I've seen a lot of pastors over the years. They fell into sin, sexual immorality. They were disqualified from pastoring any longer in Calvary Chapel, but God is still using them. They still can have a testimony because they've repented, but there's always consequences. But as you've probably heard many times over the years, our God is the God of second chances. He's a God of third, fourth, fifth chances. I mean, our God is very gracious and merciful. The Bible is full of examples of God, um, God's people blowing it, messing up, falling into sin, but then God forgiving them and restoring them and using them once again. Whether it was Abraham who lied about Sarah being his wife, or whether it was Moses, as we saw earlier, where he committed murder, he struck down the Egyptian whether it was King David who committed adultery and then murder, or Peter cursing and swearing that he didn't even know Jesus when he denied the Lord three times, but they all found forgiveness and restoration from the Lord. 
And God was able to use them once again for his plans and purposes. Now, to crash and burn because of sin, it's never a good thing, but God is always good. And as we'll see, brokenness and humility and genuine repentance is what God is looking for in, in order for us to be used and restored once again. So let's pick up in chapter 33, starting in verse 1. So this is after they had sinned tremendously. God has struck down 3,000 Israelites because of their sin and rebellion. Then the Lord said to Moses, Depart and go up from here, you and the people whom you have brought out of the land of Egypt. And we see this going back and forth. God says, they're your people, Moses. Moses is like, no, no, they're not my people. They're your people, God. I don't want them. You take them. And God's testing Moses to see where his heart is because God knows these are my people. They, I've chosen them. He knows they're not perfect, but he chose them. He's got a plan for them, but he's testing Moses here. So go from here. You and the people whom you have brought up out of the land of Egypt to the land which I swore to Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, saying to your descendants, I will give it. And I will send my angel before you, and I will drive out the Canaanite, and the Amorite, and the Hittite, and the Perizzite, and the Hivite, and the Jebusite, in other words, all the parasites in the land. Go up to the land flowing with milk and honey, for I will not go up in your midst, lest I consume you on the way. For you are a stiff-necked people. And when the people heard this bad news, they mourned, and no one put on his ornaments. That was all the jewelry. We'll talk about that in a moment. For the Lord said, had said to Moses, Say to the children of Israel, You are a stiff-necked people. I could come up in your midst in a moment, in one moment, and consume you. Now, therefore, take off your ornaments, that I may know what to do to you. So the children of Israel stripped themselves of their ornaments by Mount Horeb. So this is all at the base of Mount Sinai. Now, this is what you might call a good news, bad news scenario. First, the good news, the Lord lets Moses know that they are still going to the promised land. Even though the Jews are unfaithful at this moment, God is always faithful. He will fulfill his word. He even says he will send his angel before them. Some ver Mine says, you know, capital angel, as in pre-incarnate Jesus going before them. Whether it's the case or not, we're not 100% sure. But, you know, he's going to send his angel before them. And they will go to the land, it says, flowing with milk and honey. This must have been a huge relief to hear God telling them these things. Um... This is one of many examples, though, that God's plans for Israel were never based on the people's faithfulness, but it was always based on God's faithfulness. He knew they were going to blow it. He knew they were going to rebel, but God gave them his word. And so if anybody ever tells you, oh, it's replacement theology, the Jews, he's, God has done with the Jews, he's done with Israel, that means nothing today, run there's no such, biblically, there's no such thing as replacement theology. God is not done with the Jews. In fact, the whole seven-year great tribulation time is God re dealing with the Jews directly. And at, at the end of the great tribulation, when Jesus returns, it says every Jew that survives will get saved. They will turn to Jesus as Messiah. So he has not replaced the Jews with us. Jews are part of the church that when they come to Jesus as Messiah, but don't buy into this lie of replacement theology that all these things in the Old Testament no longer apply to the Jews. It's only for us, the church. That is wrong. That is not biblical in any way. So they were not faithful at this time, but God is always faithful. God has given them both unconditional promises that he would bring them into the land, even as he says here. But then there are also conditional promises. If you do these things, if you sin, I will bring judgment against you. So God's given them two different types of promises, unconditional and conditional. So don't get those mixed up because God is not finished with the Jews. He keeps his word to the people of Israel. The land that they're in today is God's land. They've never experienced all of the land that God promised them, 
But after we return with the Lord and he establishes his kingdom, then they will understand how much of the promised land is actually theirs. And the Jews that make it through the great tribulation will then repopulate that area and they will experience the millennial reign of their Messiah, Jesus, in a very powerful, wonderful way. But we see the same principle in the New Testament. 2 Timothy 2.13, Paul says, if we, the church, if we are faithless, he remains faithful, he cannot deny himself. The promise of salvation, it's not based on any good works we could ever do or even our best efforts because none of us are righteous. No, not one. We've all sinned. We've all fallen short of the glory of God. But our salvation is based strictly upon the finished work of Jesus Christ, the spotless blood that he shed upon the cross, even as we just sang a moment ago. Our salvation, our eternal life, is a free gift that Jesus offers to anyone who will believe in him, who will receive him by faith as their Lord and Savior. Ephesians 2, verses 8 and 9 clearly says, For by grace you have been saved through faith, and that not of yourselves. It is the gift of God, not of works, lest anyone should boast. None of us can boast, I deserve to go to heaven because I did this. No, we're we're going to heaven because Jesus did it all for us. We simply put our faith and trust in Him. That means we are going to the promised home of heaven, even though we still sin, even though we may blow it from time to time here on earth. And so that's the good news for the Israelites. The bad news is, God says, I'm no longer going to dwell in your midst. I'm moving outside of your midst. At this point, he's been in the very midst of the 12 tribes of Israel. So he takes the Shekinah glory, the cloud, he goes outside the camp of Israel. That's the bad news. Now, what God is doing with Israel is what a godly parent should be doing with their rebellious child. You discipline them because you love them. And that's what he's doing. He's disciplining them. It's like God is putting the Israelites in a timeout. Go to your room. Think about what you have done. And I don't want you to do this again. And God's purpose in this is that his children will grow and mature. And his ultimate desire is for his children to have a change of heart to understand that God loves us. What does that mean? That God cares for us. What does that mean? We say these words, but what does it mean? He wants us to have a change of heart. He only wants what is best for us, his children. This is seen throughout the Bible as well. Whenever God's people fail and fall into sin, he wants us to recognize that his ways are so much higher than our ways. His plans for us are so much greater than our own plans. His ways are going to set us free Our ways will bring us into bondage. And so all of this has to do with denying ourselves, taking up our cross, and drawing closer to Jesus. He's looking looking for us to have a truly humble, broken heart, to have true godly sorrow and genuine repentance. He doesn't want us making more excuses, empty promises, He doesn't want us saying, oh, I want you to try harder. Or he certainly doesn't want us saying, God, I'll try harder next time. Don McClure, who's part of CCA, Calvary Chapel Association and Leadership, many years ago I heard him say, God does not want us to try harder. He wants us to die harder. Think about it. Stop trying to make yourself better. Stop trying to make yourself righteous. You can't. He wants you to die harder. Die to your flesh. Die to your will, your wants, your supposed needs. Die to yourself and say, not me, Lord, your will be done. I need to die to my flesh so that Jesus can rule and reign in me. You know, David's psalm of repentance was after his great sin. He says this, Psalm 51, starting in verse 16. For you do not desire sacrifice or else I would give it. Oh, Lord, I promise I'll stop. I'll try harder next time. No, you do not delight in burn offering. What can I give, Lord? Maybe give more money to the church. Maybe that'll help me feel better about my sin. No, the sacrifices of God are a broken spirit, a broken and a contrite heart. These, O oh God, you will not despise. That's what he's looking for. We're at the end of ourselves. Lord, I can't do this anymore. I got to surrender it all to you. And I know you love me. I know you will forgive me. And I just got to stop 
trying to do this in my own strength. I just commit it all to you. In the New Testament, we read this, 2 Corinthians 7, starting in verse 9. Paul says, Now I rejoice, not that you were made sorry. Remember, he wrote in 1 Corinthians, all these things they were doing wrong. and He's, re he's rebuking them, calling them to repentance, because he loved them. And he says, uh, yeah, I know it made you sorry, but that your sorrow led to repentance, for you were made sorry in a godly manner. You know, I'm not laying a guilt trip on you, Paul was saying. I just want to see you broken. I want to see you humble before God, turning back to Jesus. For godly sorrow produces repentance, leading to salvation, not to be regretted. We should never regret being saved. But sorrow of the world produces death. He doesn't want us just feeling bad about, oh, I got caught. I'm bummed out. Most people in prison are bummed they got caught. But it's different to be repentant. You know, I'm on the board with the Mesa County uh, Jail Ministry, and I hear some awesome testimonies. This recent inmate just got sentenced to like 20 years in prison. But he just got saved recently, and he is rejoicing in the Lord. He's not bummed out he didn't get out. He knows he was guilty, but he's excited about, now I can be a testimony in prison, not just here in the jail, because he was a wonderful testimony to the people in the jail. Now he's going to be on fire. Even as Paul and Silas were in jail, wrongfully, they testified of God's goodness. They're singing psalms and hymns and spiritual songs in the middle of the night in that prison. They weren't bummed out. Oh, man, this is horrible. But they're rejoicing in the Lord. And God will use us wherever we are. So when we fail, God wants us to humble ourselves before Him, recognize what we've done, to know our weaknesses, and then truly cry out to Him. Because the Lord knows that if we don't, if we just shrug it off as, eh, no big deal, if we don't allow Jesus to change our hearts, then we will quickly relapse into that sin and failure once again. But God wants us to break out of those sinful cycles. He wants to set us free from those ongoing, persistent, sinful behaviors. But it's only going to happen if we take God at His word and we agree with Him what He says about sin. We agree with Him that it's poisonous, it's destructive, it's deadly. Because if we don't see sin for what it truly is, then we'll keep playing around with it. We'll pretend that it's not that big a deal. Oh, I can handle this. Until all of a sudden, like a snake, it'll start wrapping around our hearts, start squeezing the life out of us. And many of us have been there. We know what it's like, even as Christians, to fall into that sin. And it's miserable. On a national scale, you see this throughout our nation today. Everybody's angry. Everybody's discouraged. Everybody's upset. Everybody's depressed. Why? Because as a nation, we basically told God, stay away from us. We don't want you around. Starting in 1963, kick God out of public schools. No prayer in school. 1973, oh, let's legalize abortion. Let's just destroy lives in the womb. You know, it's gotten worse and worse as time goes on. What one generation tolerates, the next generation accepts. You know, I, I wrote a paper years ago on three strikes, you're out. Strike one, you sacrifice babies to Molech. God would come against them in the Old Testament. That's what we've done with abortion. S sexual sin of every type, homosexuality, bestiality. I mean, if you go through Leviticus 18, you'll go, wow, this is not good. And we see it all around us today. We're accepting it. It's the new norm. That's strike two. What is strike three? When a nation turns their back on Israel, God will judge them. And when we've done that here in the last couple months, turning our back more and more, I don't know if we're fully out of it yet. Biden says one thing one day, next thing he'll change his mind and say, we're fully behind Israel, but we're not going to let them have the weapons they need to destroy Hamas. Are you kidding me? And they're trying to say, oh, it's because of uh, civilian casualties. Name me a war when there's never been civilian casualties. Are we blocking bombs from going to Ukraine? You think Ukrainians are not killing innocent Russians? Happens every day. But we're just targeting Israel right now. And it's horrible. I mean, they're fighting for their lives. When you have an enemy next door to you, and in Lebanon, Hezbollah is saying, our goal is to annihilate every Jewish person. 
and to take over Israel. You can't say, oh, let's have a two-state solution. That'll make peace with everybody. They've already said numerous times, we don't want two states. We want all of Israel. We're going to take it all over. And Yasser Arafat years ago said, yeah, let's go for the two-state. And then he goes and brags everybody, well, we're that much you know, closer to taking over Israel and annihilating the Jews. From the river, Jordan River, to the sea, the Mediterranean Sea, Palestine will be free. That means annihilation of the Jews. So don't be deceived by our government or the people out there in our colleges. They're idiots. They have no idea what they're talking about. They have no clue what God has got planned and in store for his people, the Jewish people. And that promise that God gave to Abraham in Genesis 12, 3, it's still valid today. I will bless those who bless you. I will curse those who curse you. So be careful. You've got to stand with Israel. There's no, make no mistake about it. I have no idea where I am right now. <laughs> On a national scale, <laughs> we're in trouble. But again, whenever a person or a people group humbles themselves before the Lord and says, I need you, Jesus. I, I, I need you, Lord. He is quick to save, heal, and restore, and forgive. And he will deliver us from the lies of the, more, uh, the most inferior power, which is Satan. Don't give in to Satan's lies. That's why Jesus came from heaven to earth. Jesus says this, Luke 4, 18. You're familiar with this verse. The Spirit of the Lord is upon me because he has anointed me to preach the gospel to the poor. He has sent me to heal the brokenhearted, to proclaim liberty to the captives, recovery of sight to the blind, to set at liberty those who are oppressed. And those are things that only Jesus can do. You will never find what you need in a bottle of pills or in a quart of whiskey or even in a relationship with a good person, a nice person. Only Jesus can provide what you really need. Only Jesus can meet all of your needs according to his riches and glory. Forgiveness, redemption, a new beginning, everlasting life, and a relationship with your Creator that will last forever and ever. That's what we need. That's what we grow in and develop. And then all of our other relationships will fall into the right place. But if you put others first, God second, it's not going to work. When I look around at the vast majority of people in this world, I see more and more hopelessness, bitterness, frustration. And again, it's simply because they're buying into the lies of Satan. The sad thing is, they don't even realize it. We have amazing contrast in God's Word between the ways of the world and the ways of the Lord. The fruit of the Spirit versus the lies of our enemy, the wickedness of our flesh. Here's a great one, Galatians 5, starting in verse 19. First, the ways of the world, our flesh. Now the works of the flesh are evident, which are... Adultery, fornication, uncleanness, lewdness, pretty much Hollywood. Idolatry, sorcery, hatred, contentions, pretty much our college campuses today. Jealousies, outbursts of wrath, Hamas, Hezbollah. Selfish ambitions, dissensions, heresies, envy, murders, drunkenness, revelries, and the like, of which I tell you beforehand, just as I also told you in time past, that those who... Practice, it means habitually practice such things, will not inherit the kingdom of God. So here's the other side of the coin. But the fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, long-suffering, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, self-control. Against such there is no law, and those who are Christ have crucified the flesh with its passions, that's lusts, and desires, if we live in the Spirit, let us also walk in the Spirit. So we need to crucify our flesh. It's no longer I who live, but Christ lives in me. In the life I now live in the flesh, I live by faith in the Son of God who loved me and gave himself for me. So this inward work of the Holy Spirit, who's living inside of us, should also manifest himself through our lives as we walk and as we live in this world. That's the only way people are going to see light and salt, is if we walk in the Spirit. If you're in the flesh, they don't see it. If you're in the Spirit, that's when they will see more of Jesus and less of us. Another thing we see here in uh, verses 5 and 6, 
Well, first good news, we're not going to finish the chapter today. So another thing we see in verses 5 and 6 is that God tells the people to take off your ornaments. What's that talking about? It's the gold jewelry. Remember when they fled Egypt, they asked the Egyptians, and they loaded up all the Israelite women with gold and silver and jewels and all this, uh, uh, what do you call it, garments, and all these costly things. And so that's what they had as they fled Egypt. All those things were supposed to be used for building the tabernacle that we've already talked about. They haven't built it yet, but all these things are for building the tabernacle, the Holy of Holies, the Holy Place, all the implements and all the furniture and all those things we've looked at. But the women, were remember how they built the gold calf? Give me your earrings. That's part of the gold. That's supposed to go to the sanctuary. And so they build the gold calf. And all these women are wearing all this fancy stuff, just glittering. And this is not a prohibition against jewelry, by the way. But they were wearing it in such a way, they're trying to draw attention to themselves. They were using it, worshiping idols. They were provocative. Look at me, draw close to me, see how beautiful I am. And they were using it in a wrong way. And so God says, take these things off. That can be said about a lot of things. You know, the old debate, can a Christian drink wine? Well, you can drink a glass of wine. I've chosen not to because I don't want to cause anybody to stumble, but you can drink a glass of wine. That's nothing wrong with it. But if you get drunk, that's the problem. You can listen to secular music, but be careful. We just came back from Tennessee. Man, there's a lot of music out there. I don't understand. I I needed an interpreter when I was in Tennessee. Half the places you go, I was like, what? But, you know, they got all the, you know, Western, country Western music, all the bluegrass music. That was a big thing. Most of it's great. Most of it's benign. Most of it's just, you know, about family and fun. And that's great. We saw in, uh, I don't even want to tell you where we went. We saw the Kingdom Heirs, and they are a gospel group. And I'm not really into gospel music per se, but they were really good. Elizabeth and I had a great time listening to them, and they are just sharing about the Lord. You know, it's different. I'm talking about secular music. It can be benign. There's a lot of music that's fine. But then stuff I listened to before I got saved, I don't know how many of you guys remember the Jay Giles band. Oh, man, that was my band back then. Those guys were fleshly. It was all about sex and drugs and everything else. And, and it's like, when I got saved, I threw all that stuff away. I mean, it wasn't censorship. It's like, I got to get rid of this stuff. This is nasty. I don't want to listen to this stuff anymore. And, and so you're free to listen to certain things, but be careful. Some of the rap music out there, it's just cursing and swearing and killing, killing cops. I mean, why would you want to put that in your mind? You know, some of the lustful things, some of the, the depressing stuff of country music, it's like, ah, man, too much of this. You're going to just be wanting to go crawl in a hole somewhere. I mean, you got to be careful. Those things, you should be able to say, is this drawing me closer to Jesus or is this making me not think about the Lord. Colossians 3, 1 through 4. If then you were raised with Christ, seek those things which are above where Christ is, sitting at the right hand of God. Set your mind on things above, not on things on the earth. For you died and your life is hidden with Christ in God. When Christ, who is our life, appears, then you also will appear with him in glory. So all of this comes back to you and me truly believing that God knows what is best for us, that he cares about us, and he wants the best for us. But it's when we don't believe that is true. That is when we start compromising a little bit here, a little bit there. We'll start walking in the shadows as if to say, and I've had Christians say this to me, ask me, how far can I walk in the world and still be a Christian? It's like, how close to the edge of a cliff do you want to walk? Does it just take a little gust of wind to knock you over? And then you're toast? You know, you want to build on solid ground. You know, Grand Mesa, great example. If you're in the middle of the Grand Mesa, unless you're on a lake, but if you're in the middle, I mean, you're you're safe, you're secure. You go to the edge, and there's some edges. You can look down, it's like, wow, that's a long way down. Oh, you want to say, well, I wonder if I can lean over. You know, people do this on Mount Garfield. It's got that blowhole that came up, you know, and if you're standing there, I did this once. John was holding my belt because <laughs> it's like you can lean over and because there's so much wind it'll hold you up but it's like don't let go 
You know, but some Christians are like that. How far can I get to the edge and still be a Christian? Be careful. That's the wrong kind of attitude for us to have. Rather, it should be, Lord, keep me close to you. If I ever start to drift away, get a hold of my heart, get a hold of my mind, and draw me back. So watch what Moses does in response to God saying, I won't go up with you in your midst, lest I consume all these people along the way. So when Moses hears that, here we see him as the intercessor. Verse 7, Moses took his tent and pitched it outside the camp, far from the camp, and called it the tabernacle of meeting. So they haven't built the tabernacle yet. This is Moses taking his tent, moving it to where God's presence was. And it came to pass that everyone who sought the Lord went out to the tabernacle of meeting, which was outside the camp. So it was whenever Moses went out to the tabernacle that all the people rose, and each man stood at his tent door and watched Moses until he had gone into the tabernacle. And it came to pass when Moses entered the tabernacle that the pillar of cloud descended and stood at the door of the tabernacle, and the Lord talked with Moses." All the people saw the pillar of cloud standing at the tabernacle door, and all the people rose and worshipped each man in his tent door. So even though God said that he would not dwell with them in the center of their camp, he did not abandon them either. He just moved his presence. God is omnipresent, but in this case, he moves his presence, the cloud, outside the camp. But I love what Moses does here. He takes his own tent and he moves it to where the Lord is. That's a good thing to do. For a short time, before the real tabernacle is built, Moses' tent becomes the dwelling place of God's presence. It's as if Moses says, Okay, Lord, I understand that the people have sinned, they've grieved you, but I just want you to know that I can't live without you. I, I can't serve these people on my own. I need you, Lord. And so what an act of faith this is on Moses' part. God graciously met with Moses in his tent. All the people saw this. And whenever he goes into his tent, it says the, the glory cloud descended upon Moses' tent. And whenever this happened, it says all the Israelites stood up. They look outside their tents and they begin to worship the Lord. So in spite of their great sin, against the Lord, now they're beginning to understand a little bit more of God's nature and His character, that He's not against them, that He does love them. He's not going to put up with their sinful behavior, but He's got a better plan for them. And so the people are starting to understand, yes, He is awesome. Yes, He is powerful. Yes, He is capable of wiping us out in an instant. But yes, He is going to keep His promises to us. He does care for us. He did choose us as his own special people. And yes, he does have a plan for our lives. And what Moses does here by moving his tent outside the camp, it's a beautiful picture of Jude verse 21. Check out this verse. It's one of my favorite verses in the New Testament. It says, keep yourselves in the love of God. Keep yourselves in the love of God of God looking for the mercy of our Lord Jesus Christ unto eternal life. That's exactly what Moses is doing. He's keeping himself in the love of God. And that's what God is wanting from you and me today. He wants us to draw near to him. He wants us to know him better. He wants us to know his heart towards us, his mind towards us, to experience his love. And so why would we look anywhere else when God has all that we need? And just like Moses made his tent a tabernacle, we need to make our homes a, a welcoming place for the Lord. You know, is there anything in your home you're ashamed of? Well, get rid of it. Is there anything in your home you don't think is pleasing to the Lord? Get rid of it. There's a great little booklet. I don't know if it's still in print. It's called My Heart, Christ's Home. And it's just a little book. It's great. It was a long time ago. It came out. And it's basically when Jesus comes into your life, he, he dwells in your heart, and your, house, your heart is like his house. Now, all these different rooms and closets in your house, and you want him to have access to everything. 
But in the booklet, it talks about, oh, Lord, you're welcome to sit in the living room here. Just don't go check out that closet. You know, Lord, don't go over there. God's like, no, I want to clean up everything. I want to have full access to every part of your life because he does love us. He does care for us. Jesus is the guest of honor. Have you dedicated your home for service to the Lord? Um, you know, Elizabeth and I can't tell how many times we've had people in our home and they're like, we really sense something different here. Oh, there's such a peace about your place. We feel so much at rest when we're here. We've had this from strangers that we've had come over and stay with us. And it's just the Lord. It's not us. It's not because we redecorated for the 20th time this month. (laughs) I like things the way they are, but anyway, I know when to quit. Never forget, though, Jesus is with us. He is in our midst. Never forget that Jesus lives inside of our hearts. Our bodies are now the tabernacle of God. This is what Paul says, 1 Corinthians 6.19. Or do you not know that your body is the temple of the Holy Spirit who is in you, whom you have from God? You are not your own. Again, we were bought at a price. The blood of Jesus, we belong to him. John 1.1. In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. Verse 2 says that He was in the beginning with God. Verse 14, it goes on to say, And the Word became flesh and dwelt among us. The word dwelt means tabernacle. He tabernacled among us, and we beheld His glory. The glory is of the only begotten of the Father, full of grace and truth. So again, be careful. Never lose sight of the fact that Jesus is here. He dwells in us. He moves among us. He says, I'll never leave you nor forsake you. I'm with you always to the end of the age. So don't take advantage or don't take that for granted. Take advantage of it by spending time growing that relationship with him. Now look at verse 11. This is an amazing verse. So the Lord spoke to Moses face to face as a man speaks to his friend and he would return to the camp. But his servant Joshua, the son of Nun, a young man did not depart from the tabernacle. So both Moses and Joshua were in an amazing relationship with the Lord. Here it says that God spoke to Moses face to face. Now when we get to verse 20, we'll see that God tells him, nobody can see my face and live. So what does that mean, speaking face to face as to a friend? God had to tune down, tone down his glory, so to speak. If God appeared in his full glory right now in this building, we would be little crispy critters. We'd vaporize. We couldn't stand it. So it's not until we're on our resurrection bodies and we're in his presence, then we can see him face to face, or he has to tone down his glory like he did with Moses on Mount Sinai, like he did here when the kind of glory came down. He has to tone it down so they're not vaporized. So he's not seeing him because God says, you can't see me and live. Otherwise, you'd be dead. So the point is Moses and Joshua were able to talk communicate with God, it says, as a friend. Isn't that amazing? That's really what the Lord wants with all of us. He desires for us to be in a close, intimate relationship with Him. He wants us to talk to Him as to a friend. You know, don't be like, oh, God out there in the universe somewhere, and, you know, and be all intimidated by Him like He's waiting with a lightning bolt. Oh, you say the wrong thing, boom, you're dead. That's not God. He wants to talk to you as a friend. This is what Jesus says in John 15, 15. No longer do I call you servants, for a servant does not know what his master is doing, but I have called you friends. For all things that I have heard from my Father, I have made known to you. Now, I love at the end of verse 11 where it says of Joshua that even though Moses left and he would return to the camp, Joshua did not depart from the tabernacle. It's like he wants to stay as close to the Lord as he can. And that, that's wonderful. I mean, this reminds me of the two men, resurrection Sunday morning, the two guys leave Jerusalem, they're heading back to Emmaus, it's a seven mile hike, and they're walking, and this is now resurrection Sunday afternoon, and they're all bummed out, they're discouraged, oh, we were hoping he was the one, and Jesus comes alongside of them, they don't even recognize him, because they hadn't even believed the women, oh, he's risen, we saw him, yeah, you guys are crazy. And so Jesus shows up and he's walking them with them. They don't see it. 
They don't recognize him. And then it says, he began with Moses through all the prophets, the things pertaining to himself from the Old Testament scriptures. He gives them the most amazing Bible study about the Messiah from the Old Testament and everything, all the prophecies, all the examples. I mean, seven mile hike, it's going to take a while. So he just lays it all out there and they're beginning to realize, okay, something's different here. So we read this, Luke 24, 28. Then they drew near to the village, that's Emmaus, where they were going, and he, Jesus, indicated that he would have gone further, or farther, but they constrained him, saying, Abide with us, or dwell with us, for it is toward evening, and the day is far spent. And he went in to stay with them. And that's what Jesus was hoping they would do. They constrained him. It literally means they begged him. Oh, you, you need to come. you got to come into our house. We got to give you a meal. We, we don't want you to leave. The things you're saying are just blowing us away. We want to hear more about what, what these prophecies are. And sure enough, it didn't take long for them to recognize. It says when Jesus broke the bread, he's in their house, he breaks the bread, he hands it to them, and it says their eyes were open. And they said, that's the Lord, and he disappears. But they probably saw the nail print in his hands when he gives them the bread, and they realize this is our Messiah. Here's Joshua. He's just soaking it all in. He's in the best place possible in the presence of the Lord. Look at verse 12. Then Moses said to the Lord, See, you say to me, bring up this people. So he's interceding here. But you have not let me know whom you will send with me. Yet you have said, I know you by name, and you have also found grace in my sight. Now, therefore, I pray, if I have found grace in your sight, show me your now your way that I may know you and that I may find grace in your sight and consider that this nation is your people. They're not mine, God. These are your people. But I love this because Moses does not appeal to God based on God's justice. Again, if that was the case, they all would have been destroyed. God even said, I could start over with you, Moses. He goes, no, no, these are your people. So Moses wisely appeals to God based on God's grace. Four times in this section, the word grace is used. Don't think grace is some New Testament concept. You know, after Adam and Eve sinned, it was only God's grace that he didn't wipe them out. He covered them with animal skins, and he provided for them. Moses knew that God was gracious and merciful, and that the people, even though they were sinful and rebellious, he knew God's grace was greater. And so again, Moses is interceding on behalf of the people. But verse 13 is so amazing here. And this is why Moses is considered one of the greatest men of all time. Notice both his humility and his boldness here. His humility says, I pray if I have found grace in your sight. That's, that's being humble before God. But then the boldness here, show me your way. Wow, that, that's a, quite a statement. Now, the parallel verse to this is found in Psalm 103, verse 7. It says, He, the Lord, made known His ways to Moses, His acts to the children of Israel. Now, there's a distinction here. He made known to Israel, the people, His acts. That would be His acts of power, His acts of, you know, miracles, his acts of, you know, doing these mighty things in their presence. And the people are pretty much content with that. That's all we need. As long as God keeps feeding us the manna, as long as he keeps giving us water from the rock, as long as he keeps the cloud over us to keep us cool by day, fire by night, okay, we're content with that. They knew his acts. But Moses is like, I want to know your ways. I, I want to know you more. I want to get deeper in this relationship with you. He wants to know God's heart, his mind. He wants to know God in a more personal, intimate way. God, what things do you love? What things do you hate? God, what, what things are pleasing to you? For a long time, King David was the same way, and that's why he was called a man after God's own heart. That should be our desire as well, just to know the Lord more, to grow in our relationship with him. Remember when Philip said to Peter, Lord, just show us the Father, and then that'll be enough. After three and a half years of all the miracles, 
all the wonderful things Jesus did in their presence. Just show us the Father, they will believe in you. John 14, 9, Jesus said to him, Have I been with you so long, and yet you have not known me, Philip? He who has seen me has seen the Father, so how can you say, show us the Father? In other words, if you really want to know God, if you really want to know his heart and his mind, then study the life and ministry of Jesus. Go to the Word of God. Throughout the Word of God, you find all these references to Jesus, who he is, the things he loves, the things he hates. And then all you need to do is just draw closer to him, knowing that he paid the ultimate price for you because he loves you. Real quickly, look at verse 14. And the Lord said, he said, my presence will go with you and I will give you rest. So I'm going to go with you, even though God initially says, I'm not going to go with you. I'll send an angel. Now he says to Moses, all right, I'll go with you. I'll give you rest in the land. Then he said to him, if your presence does not go with us, do not bring us up from here. For how then will it be known that your people have found grace in your sight, except you go with us, so we shall be separate, your people and I, from all the people who are upon the face of the earth. So the Lord said to Moses, I will also do this thing that you have spoken, for you have found grace in my sight, and I know you by name. Moses is really on a roll here. The first thing he asks the Lord is, please don't destroy your people. And God says, okay, I won't. And then he says, I want to know your ways. And God says, okay, I will. Then he says, Lord, if you don't go with us, then just leave us here in the wilderness to die. And God says, all right, I'll go with you. I'll do this thing also. Again, what an amazing scene. The bottom line is, if God is not in it, whatever it is, then I don't want to be part of it. If God's not in it, then don't be a part of it. That's a really good way to live our lives. If God is not involved in this area of my life, then I probably shouldn't be involved with it either. I want to know his ways. I want to hear his voice through his word. It's going to get even better next time if we're still here next week. I hope we go home. But if we're here, he's going to say to the Lord, taking it even a step deeper, I want to see your glory. Not just know you, God, in a surfacey way. Not just know your ways, but I want to know your glory. And God's going to reveal to him in, in the next section just the greatest revelation of God in the Old Testament, I believe, where he's going to speak his name. And what is his name? Gracious, merciful, compassionate. He, he describes his nature and character to Moses in the most beautiful, amazing way in the Old Testament, I believe. So read ahead. We'll close here.